very warm welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to each one of you. I'm glad to see you in the Lord's house today. You know, uh, where we live there in Illinois, if you go straight down 31, you get down to McHenry. Late last year, they, they built a uh, Popeye's chicken down there. And, and I heard somebody recently say they wondered if at Popeye's chicken, if the chicken is fried in olive oil. <laughs> I know how to say it. So when you go out to eat, you're looking for nourishment for the body. When you go out to come to church or when you tune in on the live stream, you're looking for nourishment for the soul. And the Lord promises richly in his word and in his sacrament to meet us and to give us those very things that we need for faith and life. That's why I'm so glad that you're here. Our opening hymn is from all that dwell below the skies and we'll stand on the last verse. <laughs> Jesus Christ, to be gracious and 
Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a call and ordained servant of the word announce the grace of God unto each of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. While you die, 
people of Israel, for I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord, repent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Philippine, Philippine, 2, 1 through 18. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ and comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit and affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. Do nothing but selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Humility, count others often significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have you mind among yourselves which is your which which is yours in Christ Jesus, who through he was in the form of God, did not count equality with good a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeliness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him. Name that is every name, so that, it, so that at the name of the Jesus every knee, every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to, to be glory of God and the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you are always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all these things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as light in the world, holding fast to the world of life, so that, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be uh, poured out in a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with all you. Likewise, you always should be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please rise for the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel? Alleluia, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from men? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes Go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be 
seated for the two. Um, 
generally you could still count on the PAO though. The PAO would keep people away from us if they didn't think that they were kind of friendly toward our mission. So I was interviewed when I was active duty by um, Katie McFarland and David Webb. You know those names? I got to have interviews with them. It's kind of neat. But it didn't always go that well. I remember one time our ship had launched a mission um, against Saddam Hussein's illegal command and control centers. And so we had a Danish reporter out on the ship and he wanted to talk to me. So he said, what's your job here as a chaplain? And I answered him, I said, I'm here to remind people that God is in all of this. Now, you know what I meant by that, right? That while we're engaged in, in, in combat, while we're far away from home, while we're far away from our families, God is still there with us. My role is to tell the military members that. But he took it as though I was saying, God is in this combat that we're doing. God is on our side. And he wants us to fight against the enemy. So he starts snapping pictures of me and writing furiously. Ah, I had to extricate myself from that. But one of the things that I remember from what I learned there had to do with the way questions and answers from the press really are not a way for us to answer questions. They're a way for us to get our message out. In other words, whatever good thing we happen to be doing on that particular mission, we wanted to be able to talk about that. That was the first time I ever realized that. Maybe you have seen that for a long time, but I never did before that. But ever since then, every single day, when I watch interviews on the news, when I watch the press, you can see it all the time. It almost doesn't matter what question the questioner asks because the person that answers the question is massaging that answer with the goal of not answering the question but getting out their talking points, right? And don't you admit, you have to be diplomatic sometimes, but doesn't it start to drive you crazy? You know all the gotcha questions you see in so-called journalism today, but every once in a while there's an honest, but challenging, straight up kind of question. And doesn't it drive you crazy when you see somebody and, and they tie themselves in knots because they really don't want to answer the question? You can see the wheels in their minds working as they're trying to think, how do I say this so I don't anger my base? How do I say this so that I use the right words that the focus group was telling me I should be, be using? Uh, Governor, some people are saying that when the, the rioters are throwing projectiles at the police that they should be condemned as domestic terrorists. Do you, see, do you think they should be condemned, Governor? Well, it's undeniable that I've always been against violence, right? But we need to be looking at the good protesters who are supporting the work of getting rid of systemic racism, right? Doesn't it drive you crazy when you see that stuff? Well, it won't surprise you to learn that feckless people pleasers are not a new phenomenon. They've been around for a long time. In our gospel text, it's Holy Week. Jesus had just a couple days before come into Jerusalem in the triumphant entry. And now this is the first of several texts that show that during that week, the tension between Jesus and the religious leaders there was rising. And so while he's teaching in the temple, the chief priests and the elders come to him. Now the chief priests were those who were responsible at the upper tiers uh, for the daily activities and functioning of the temple. The elders were probably the leaders that were part of the Sanhedrin, but were not part of uh, the, the, the family. They weren't descended from Aaron, so they wouldn't have been priests. And they interrupt Jesus while he's teaching, and they have a gotcha question. By what authority are you doing these things? And, and who gave you this authority? Well, you see what they're trying to do? They're trying to get them in a public place, in the temple, filled with thousands of people, in constant view of the Romans sitting up in Antonia Fortress looking down on them to make a plain and bold statement that Jesus had God's authority. And in their minds, that would be such a blasphemous thought that then they got him. Then it's just going to be obvious to everybody that he's a threat and he needs to be subdued. And so Jesus answers him. Jesus answers with a question of his own. 
I heard people say a long time ago, it's probably not a fair characterization, but maybe you've heard somebody say that Jews like to answer questions with a question. Jesus, of course, was Jewish. I was looking at a Jewish website, a, a girl named Marnie, and she was talking about when she grew up. And she would say something like, isn't it a gorgeous day? And her mother would say, so the sun is out. Should I do cartwheels? Or she would say to her father, I found a great used car. He would say, so who can afford insurance? Or she'd say, it's so nice out. Let's go for a drive. And her mother would say, with all the crowds, who drives on a Sunday? And she said this would go on and on. She, she said she was 25 years old until she could make a declaration without asking a question. Well, that wasn't it. Jesus didn't answer a question with a question because it was kind of in his blood. He wasn't being evasive. He wasn't trying to avoid the question. What he was doing was turning it back on them because his question to them spotlights the answer which they should have already known. I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? John the Baptist, now what does he have to do with all of this? Well, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. John the Baptist was the one who publicly declared that Jesus was the one for whom he was repairing, uh, preparing. He said he was the voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the ways of the Lord. And so if he's preparing the way of the Lord, and it's for Jesus, then Jesus is the coming of the Lord. He's the one who said Jesus was mightier than he was. He's the one who said he was not worthy to untie Jesus' sandals. He's the one who said that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. By what authority do you do these things? Well, if you had listened to John and believed him, you would know the answer to that question. But Jesus' antagonists are like those feckless politicians or those, those feckless chief priests and elders. They can't just answer an honest, simple question honestly or simply. First, you can see, they have to calculate with their answer. How is this going to play with public opinion? It says, and they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for all hope that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Why shouldn't? Why cast your pearls before swine? There are some people who will ask you questions, and there are some kinds of questions that frankly just don't even warrant a response. They don't. But Jesus does respond. His response is spoken in a parable. And we've already seen in the Gospel of Matthew, parables are designed sometimes to help us understand something complicated a little bit better. But parables also are designed to conceal something from the people whose hearts are not right. And so he tells the parable of the two sons. The first son is the one who will not go to the vineyard to work when the father directs him. And afterward, he changes his mind and he goes. And he compares this later in the parable with the tax collectors and the prostitutes, who though they may have gone wrong in their lives at first, they believed the way of righteousness when John brought it to them, and so they enter into the kingdom of God. Now, when we make an application of this text to our own lives, there's something we need to note here. The sons who go into the vineyard, or the one who doesn't go into the vineyard, to what does that correspond for us? Well, he's telling us here then, isn't he? It's believing John when he came in the way of righteousness. In other words, John fulfilled all righteousness by baptizing Jesus, by presenting Jesus as the one who was the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And they believed him, it says. They had faith, that's what belief is, to trust that this way of righteousness which was being declared to them by John was the case. 
So the son who changes his mind in the parable is contrasted in verse 32 of our text with the chief priests and elders who did not change their mind when they saw. They did not believe John the Baptist. So the correspondence here is to believe and to have faith. Even if you have said no to God in your past life, even if you've been a tax collector, that sounds worse than a prostitute, doesn't it? <laughs> or if you've been a prostitute, whatever you have done, wherever your life has gone, whatever sins you may have committed, as you believe, as you trust Christ, and as his work of forgiveness and reconciliation for you on the cross is believed by you, as you stop fighting with God and you take his promise made to you in your baptism and through the message of the gospel to you, guess what? You belong to him. All of that is gone. Your life is new and it's fresh and you're clean. And he does that to you every day again and again and again. Now there was another son in the story. That was the son who who calculated first, right? Like the scribe, like the chief priests and the elders. What does my father want to hear when he asks me to go into the vineyard and work? Like the like the squirrely politicians. What's the answer that's going to get me the most capital here? What's going to give me the most approval? Even though that was not what was in his heart and his mind. So I want to ask you. As we prepare now in a moment to stand and recite the Apostles' Creed together, don't do it because that's what's expected of you. Don't do it because that's what we always do. Don't do it because you think that's what people want, want to hear right now. With your heart and with your lips, in the presence of the Almighty God sitting upon His throne and watching us right now from heaven, surrounded by the witnesses of all the saints who have gone on to their eternal reward and are looking down on us right now, bolstered by the praises of the ranks of the heavenly hosts and angels looking at us right now, and despite the snarling evil glares of the fallen angels who may be looking at us right now, before the whole world and before all creation, say what you really want. Would you rise now and join with me in confessing what all Christians have always believed in the words of the Apostles? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayer. O Lord God, we, your people, gather before you, we whom you have chosen by your grace to be your own everlasting possession, we who have received mercy upon mercy, we come before you, and we ask that you would hear us as we cry out to you for those who are in need, and as we call upon you to remember us according to your good favor that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would encourage us by the Holy Spirit. We pray in particular, Lord, for those who are falling into despair or despondency or depression, those upon whom a dark cloud has gathered because of uh, various things going on in their own lives and in the world around us. And we ask, O oh Lord, that even as the sound of a rushing wind on Pentecost came upon the apostles, that so the Spirit will bring a fresh wind upon them, blowing away the fog, blowing away the smoke, letting the light shine on their faces, O oh God. 
that they will be of one mind and one heart with all the saints, serving you in gladness, experiencing afresh the joy of the Holy Spirit, and able to do, O Lord, the works of the kingdom and experience the fruits of the Spirit as he moves in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord, that the word of the gospel would continue to go forth, that you would bless, O Lord, your church around the world, that you would bless all missionaries and evangelists and pastors and those who are called into positions of bringing the gospel to those who have not heard. We pray, O God, that you would raise up and restore to yourself all those that you are calling into your church, as you call the animals into Noah's Ark to rescue them from the flood and the disaster that was coming, so, Lord, all around the world, call your people and bring them into the holy ark of the church, the place where people are saved, that place where people call upon Christ as their Savior. And so, Lord, we ask that all of those efforts in the church around the world will have your unction and your blessing upon them. We pray, Lord, too, for the persecuted church, for those who are suffering, Lord, in Pakistan, in Nigeria, in China, and in so many places around the world, people who, because they stand upon their faith, suffer the loss of property, the loss of reputation, and sometimes even the loss of life and limb. We ask, O oh God, that you would give them boldness and that their work and their words will be multiplied as you, Lord, draw other people to Christ who observe them and see what they have done. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that you would shine your light upon us as citizens of this, this wonderful country where you have blessed us to be a part. Lord, we have prayed so much against the abomination of abortion, and now we see before our eyes what you have brought about and now we have the opportunity to have a new justice who will judge not by, by pro-abortion ideology, but will judge the law. And so we ask, O oh God, that you would continue to take steps around us and in our midst so that evil, Lord, will be suppressed, that righteousness will grow. But Lord, we know too that people, although the law changes, people's hearts can only be changed by you. And so sweep across our nation, Lord. Change the hearts of people. Grant, O oh Lord, that people will see the truth, that they will see clearly, that they will have discernment and wisdom, and also that their hearts then will, in so many places, and for so many people, and in so many ways, be receptive to the word of the God. Lord, in your mercy. I pray, Lord, for our congregation here at Hope. We pray for our Sunday school classes and all of our little children. We ask that they would grow and that just like little sponges, they would absorb the lessons that they learn from the Bible and take those things into their hearts. I pray, Lord, that you protect all of our people from this virus and from all kinds of plague and infirmity, that you would be, O oh Lord, like a shield to us of aegis to guard us from everything the devil would throw at us. We pray, Lord, that you would protect us from fear and that you would unite our hearts and under the gospel, that you would build us up, Lord, in love and strengthen us on the foundation of our faith in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And we pray, Lord, for those who have special need in our midst of healing, of comfort, of reassurance of the peace that comes from, from Christ. We think, O oh Lord, of our sister Alma, we pray, O oh Lord, for our dear sister Kay as she battles against this cancer, Lord. We pray for Doris. We pray for Ron, for Diane, for Paul recovering from surgery, for Glenn, for Courtney battling cancer, for Cohen battling leukemia, for Kathleen fighting against cancer, for, for Teresa who has fallen in the nursing home and is not recovering as the doctors might hope. Lord, for Marilyn, recovering from surgery this past week. For, for Pearl, who had fallen last week and broke a bone in her back. For Arlene and for Donna. For all those that we name to you in our hearts. You, O oh God, is the great physician. You as the creator. You have the power to manifest the kingdom in their lives and bring healing to them in whatever way you choose. But we pray not only would you do that in our midst, that Christ may be glorified, but also give them reassurance 
that your promises are yes and amen in Christ. And that they can look forward, Lord, to one day when these temporary bodies shall be dropped aside and we shall take up the new mantle, the new garment of resurrected bodies. For that, O oh Lord, we all hope and wait. Lord, in your mercy. Give us everything we need, Lord, for this body and life, everything that's profitable for our salvation. Keep from us all things that are harmful. Sustain us, Lord. Guard us from all the assaults and the schemes and machinations of the enemy. And help our faith that it would endure until the day of your coming. So that the thing that you are doing in us as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, we will see that you are the one that is at work in us, both to will and to work according to your good pleasure. Through Christ our Lord, the one who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Will you please rise as we continue with our service of Holy Communion? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and grace. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore. Praise you. Sing. <laughs>
they need the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ to give us the death and forgiveness. the body and blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you unto life everlasting. Depart in peace.
see you in the Lord's house today and have those of you uh, worshiping with us at home. The Lord bless each one of you and have a great, great week. Just a few quick announcements. Um, if, if you weren't here at the voters meeting last week, they decided uh, that since we're ending the services a little earlier, just to give everybody more time on Sundays, we're going to just back up Sunday school. So Sunday school starts now at 10.15. Not 10.30, but 10.15. And we'll finish still at 11, then uh, 15 minutes earlier. So we're just giving everybody a little more, more time in their day. That's not a bad thing, is it? But it doesn't mean you have to grab your coffee and your cake a little bit, a little bit quicker. But 10.15 for Sunday school. Hope to see you there. Um, also, a week from tomorrow, the Midwest Creation Fellowship is going to have a speaker over in Antioch. Nathan and I went to the last one they did at uh, couple months ago. It was really marvelous. So if you're if you're free a week from Monday that evening, come and see me and I'll give you the details on that. And then finally, um, we have, as you know, some of our folks who watch the service from home, they're not able to be here. And so after the, the post loop, um, Cheryl and Stan, I have the, who do the live streaming here, they're going to keep the live stream feed open for a little while. So if there's someone like Alma or somebody you'd like to come and just go on the camera for a second and say, hi, sister, we're thinking of you, praying for you, there's a great chance to do that today after the service. So I hope you'll, you'll pause and come on up and just, just say a quick hello if there's somebody that you know is watching that you miss. Any other announcements to be made, George? Yes, I have one. Last week we had our voters meeting as Pastor mentioned. And we had a very good meeting. We had many uh, stayed. For those of you that didn't remain for that meeting, I'd like to invite you, if you have not availed yourself to Sunday School, we'll plug for Pastor again. Sunday School downstairs, to at least come down there, take a look at everything downstairs. It's been completely, completely remodeled downstairs. Of course, you've noticed things upstairs here that were done just the past year. For the washrooms a couple years ago, but just this past year, Many, many things were done here, but the downstairs looks fabulous with the three rooms that were remodeled downstairs, all new lighting, it's been painted downstairs and everything, so avail yourselves of that. One other point to that is everything has been covered, not through any church finances, but all through individual donations. Uh, very, very fine members that we have here at church and have contributed to the many uh, renovations that have been done here, so we appreciate and all the time and effort to those doing the work for all my members. Thank you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you.